Hey everybody, so today I'm dealing with Greg Kokel for the second time in a row. Yep, sorry and or you're welcome. And for the second time in a row I'm making a video that's not my deconversion story. But don't worry, I'll get back to it next time starting with one about how Christian education affected my thinking. The series seems impactful for those who watch despite the lower than average views, and to me that makes it more than worth it. It's kind of the point in maintaining the algorithm is just a job. I just need a break from the personal heavy content. Anyway, today we're going to have a look at how Christians try to claim atheists believe in God but lie to themselves about it. This one comes from Graham. I understand that someone can... Oops, hold on there. This is just audio, which is boring. There, that's better. I understand that someone can, quote, suppress the truth and unrighteousness, or be a, quote, fool who has said in his heart that there is no God. I have atheist friends who are sincere searchers for truth and who are not fools. Are there other scriptural explanations for why some people do not accept the existence of God? So I have to start off by saying I appreciate where this caller's coming from. While the suppressing the truth and unrighteousness thing he's alluding to is obviously ugly, he seems to believe his friends are sincere and is looking for a way to reconcile this with the Bible. Good for him. This might not seem like a big deal, but it's a major challenge to a book he reveres and probably sees as inerrant, and it brings up awkward questions about why God hasn't made himself known to these people and will eternally punish them for being mistaken. This is a lot to confront, and with a little nudge his willingness to do so could greatly improve his relationship with his friends. So what's Greg Kokel step in and do with this teachable moment? I'm going to skip 45 seconds of rambling on and on about how he and other Christians disagree on the topic and get to this answer. Here's the way I explained it. Um, there are things that you and people believe that which beliefs they're not always consciously aware of. All right, that influence um, the way they act and things they say. These are, I think, they're called dispositional beliefs. Um, and uh, it, 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 to illustrate. <clears throat> I think there are, I think of circumstances, and anybody can think in your life, where you were finally kind of confronted by someone uh, about an attitude that you seem to display. Um, and maybe you, for a long time, have resisted that. But in a moment of, of clarity, you realize deep down inside you really knew the truth of what's been explained to you, but for emotional reasons or whatever, you've fought it. Uh, this is not an unusual experience um, in the human condition. Okay, we suppress consciously things that we know to be true, but we don't like. Okay, and I think that's the category of dispositional beliefs. And um, so this is a real category. So it looks like he starts off with a justification for calling atheists liars. Since everybody lies to themselves about things they don't want to believe, then it's not that outrageous to say atheists are lying to themselves about God, right? It's just pointing out how they share a basic human tendency towards self-deception. But this falls apart pretty quickly when you think about it. If we look at common examples of things people might lie to themselves to avoid confronting, say your spouse doesn't love you that much, your kids are out of control little jerks, you're bad at your job, or you have a drinking problem, we start to notice a trend. Each of these, one, has potential to be fairly obvious, yet two, is open to some kind of interpretation. Why are these important? The first one's necessary because if the facts of the situation aren't right there in front of your face, then you're not lying to yourself. You're just mistaken pretty straightforward. The second is necessary because it gives you the room you need to deceive yourself. For example, say your kids are horribly misbehaved. Even if this is obvious to everybody around you, it's not an objective fact with clear definitional boundaries. It's a judgment call that lies somewhere along a gradient, which means there are all kinds of plausible alternative narratives you can adopt to explain how your kids are acting. They're just energetic for their ages, you prefer to let them be free spirits and express themselves. Things are a little rough right now, but it's just a stage. They're not that different from other kids. The possibilities are endless. That's because your kids are out of control jerks isn't a demonstrable fact. It's a description that's technically subjective, even when 99% of the world would say it obviously applies. That's what makes the lie possible. 
The subjectivity of the statement gives you room to deny it, even if everybody else is rolling their eyes at you. You can't lie to yourself in the same way about objective facts, such as telling yourself your kids had black hair when they were blonde or that one of them simply didn't exist. That's why it's ridiculous to use this form of self-deception to explain disbelief in God. For one, in spite of what apologists say, God's existence is not an obvious in-your-face reality. It's a tenuous proposition that relies on elaborate lines of reasoning. I mean, if it weren't, what are Christians paying apologists for, right? You don't need the best thinkers in your religion to explain something so obvious that denying it is an act of self-deception. Second, the question of God's existence just isn't open to interpretation, at least not in the same way these statements are. It's a factual proposition. This means that lying to yourself about God's existence is not like lying to yourself about whether your kid's out of control. It's like lying to yourself about your kid's height, hair color, or, yes, existence. Now a person might say this isn't a good analogy because the kid is right in front of you and God isn't. But all that's saying is that God's properties aren't obvious, which is walking back if not outright nullifying the claim that he's an obvious in-your-face reality. You're not showing there's a way to interpret what's right in front of you. You're admitting God's not right in front of you, making the question of his existence one of evidence and not of honesty. What this amounts to is Kokel and apologists like him just brazenly striding into the debate and saying, my arguments are so obvious that if you don't agree with me, you're lying to yourself. It's unhelpful and just shows a tremendous lack of self-awareness. But um, I think that uh, that notion can help us understand something here. You have, say, atheists who will say, I'm not suppressing anything. I actually do not believe in God. And here are the reasons why. I am a seeker of truth. But of course, when you listen to the reasons that they give, in many cases, they are, and this is descriptive, this is meant to be descriptive, not disparaging. They're really shallow. We deal with these all the time. They're simply shallow beliefs. Well, first off, thanks, Greg, for saying you didn't mean to be disparaging. I feel so much better now that I understand you were just trying to be descriptive when you called my belief shallow. Second, this is exactly what I just finished talking about. What does he do when other people's arguments don't make sense to him? Does he consider that he might be wrong at least in some capacity? Or that there's at least room for intelligent, sincere disagreement? No. He doesn't get what they're saying, so they must be lying to themselves. This is an overall unhelpful thing to think or say under any circumstances. But if you say it because they don't believe in an ethereal being you can't show them and need to deduce your way to using elaborate lines of reasoning, then you've gone way off the rails and are probably unfit for constructive disagreement with anybody about anything. In fact, those beliefs they say they believe in, they don't follow through with on a regular basis when they're not defending turf. I remember the atheists I had a conversation with. Um, what's his name? We had a picture Oh, uh, Doug. On, Doug, yeah. Doug, yes. And when he's pressing me on his understanding or view of the origin of morality, he uh, <clears throat> he's talking about Darwinian evolution, a standard direction to go with that, so they don't have to go to God. I hate when people say Darwinian evolution, Darwinian evolution, is the origin of morality because it creates a lot of confusion about what we're talking about. I guess technically it's at the root of our morality in a biological sense, since our brains arose from it and cooperation and empathy have a lot of adaptive power for a species. But this can very easily be misunderstood to mean evolution is the basis of our morality or that we choose to behave certain ways to fulfill evolutionary goals. Since these goals are going to be represented in the most stupid way possible, such as individual survival or passing along your genes by any means necessary, the apologist can pretend that your behavior isn't consistent with atheism if you're nice to people instead of acting like a total barbarian. This is at the root of Kokel's point here, which I guess just shows he... doesn't have much of a point, huh? But the worst part is where he says they use evolution as an explanation so, quote, they don't have to go to God. I mean, are Christians so lacking in self-awareness that they actually think, with all the religions in the world, with all the non or barely religious people out there, that their specific God hypothesis is just the obvious explanation for morality? That we atheists notice our sense of compassion and think, wow, the only explanation for this is that an ethereal being exists and wants me to follow Christian scripture, so I'd better believe in evolution so I have an excuse to ignore it. Is that what they think? Seriously? 
If they want to just whip out a mythical narrative or something neither of us can actually explain, that's their problem. The idea that this would throw me off my game so bad that I'd rush to jump to an alternative conclusion is, and I mean to be descriptive and not disparaging, stupid. See, Greg? It wasn't mean because I said I was just being descriptive. So that's how it works, right? But of course, Darwinian evolution can only produce, if it can produce anything like that, it can only produce a relativistic morality. My obligation to a fellow human is as objective as my obligation to a god could ever be, and the dictates of a god are as subjective, and unrelated to our sense of what's moral, as the dictates of a human. This is pointless. Uh, but, of course, atheists object against the God of the Bible as being immoral. And so my question to Doug was, so what you're saying is, the depiction of the God of the Bible disagrees with your personal evolution. And he said, yes. <laughs> well, you can see how trivial that kind of objection turns out to be. I'm not sure whether this conversation is being represented accurately, but whether the specific atheist performed it as poorly as Greg says he did is beside the point. Either way, what Kokel's saying is still nonsense, even down to the phrasing. God's behavior doesn't disagree with my personal evolution. It's at odds with my conviction that we should treat other conscious beings with decency. So the only real questions here are, one, do you agree with my conviction about treating people decently? And two, do you think God's behavior as described in the Bible is at odds with his conviction? Yet instead of addressing these questions head on, Greg just blows me off because my opinions ultimately arise from my biology and life experiences, or as he very imprecisely calls it, my evolution. Is this what he does with other people who bring concerns to his attention? Does he blow off God's convictions because they're just an accident of the nature he happens to have? I doubt it. So why does he suddenly do it to me here? One can only speculate, but it seems a little like what someone would do if they wanted to change the subject. And this is the case in, in, in a, on a host of things. So uh, it, it isn't as if atheists, for example, have a strong case. And uh, rather, I think their case is really weak. But some, for some reason, they're impressed with it. So let's set aside how juvenile Greg's being here. For some reason, they're impressed with their own arguments. And get to the point. He's outright dismissing the perspective of atheists for one reason, that when they point out how God's behavior violates our general human understanding of basic decency, their opinions can be outright dismissed on the grounds that they originate from their biology. Seriously, take a moment and marinate in the sheer pointlessness of this argument, and how casually Kokel dismisses the most obvious criticisms of Christianity for pretty much no reason. Then recognize that this isn't just an attempt at explaining away God's behavior. It's the one thing Greg offers his audience as a reason to conclude atheists are lying to themselves about God. Now if I were ever to suspect someone was lying to themselves, and I'd rarely be so presumptuous, I'd make sure I had them dead to rights denying something they very clearly had to know is true. My assessment would be about the one person, and before saying anything, I'd make sure I knew the person very well and that they'd be receptive to what I was saying. Even then, I would kind of carefully probe with questions. I wouldn't just walk up and tell them they were lying. Greg shows absolutely no interest in such caution. He just calls an entire group of people liars, and he does so using a post hoc rationalization so lazy it seems he knows neither he nor his audience cares about the reason he gives as long as he goes through the motions of giving one. This is deliberately insular behavior of the most childish kind, and I talk about it not just because this specific fellow engages in it, but because it's kind of drilled into the core of Christianity, as we're about to see. And I think, um, I, I, so I'm going to stick with Scripture, God's perspective, who says, uh, even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God, but they made an exchange for something else. Or in the, uh, the Psalms, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Now, of course, in that verse, um, they are saying in their heart, there is no God. And the psalmist is saying, that's dumb. And then we can give the reasons why that's the case, because God's existence is obvious. That's Romans 1 stuff. So there we have it. The Bible badmouths atheists in all the trashy ways Kokel does. This, of course, shows us where Kokel gets the ideas he's so sloppily trying to rationalize. 
And if the Bible's suggesting all this to him, then it's probably suggesting it to a lot of other Christians. So I'm going to stick with God's assessment here, Romans 1. They're suppressing the truth and unrighteousness, but that doesn't necessarily mean they are consciously aware that they're lying to themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, a critical distinction. I think they think of themselves that they're seeking for truth, at least on a conscious basis. We might think that, but of course, Greg Kokel knows us better than we know ourselves. Um, but then what they'll do is they'll say things imp that implicitly presume the truth of a theistic worldview, like objective morality, um, and, uh, and are not at all consistent with an atheistic worldview. I've said this way too many times, because apparently I need to keep saying it, but whatever obligation I have to another person is as objective as my obligation to a god. Sorry, but another being you declare makes the rules doesn't change the basic nature of what morality is. In practical application, what this means is that I'd be good to those around me, and expect others to do the same, even if God does not exist. Would you, Greg Kokel? If so, this kind of objective expectation of decent behavior doesn't seem to presume a theistic worldview. If not, you need to own the fact that you don't have a fundamental regard for your fellow humans, which I think definitionally means you're some kind of sociopath. And these moves that they make like that um, bear testimony. They are tells of the deeper conviction they actually have. This is where the inside-out tactic in the 10th anniversary of, uh, edition of Tactics comes in. There are these truths on the inside that they can't ultimately deny. And they always come out on the outside, especially when they're not um, defending turf. What this amounts to is pretty simple. Kokel sees two options. One, have objective morals because you believe in God. Or two, act like a sociopath or see sociopathic behavior as other people's subjective preference because you don't. According to Kokel, you have to do at least one of these two things. If you disavow sociopathic behavior and universally condemn it in others, then it's obvious that deep-seated belief in God is pervasive in 90% of your life, and your claimed disbelief is just something you adopt during arguments to be stubborn. Or to defend turf, as Coco puts it. As complicated as morality is, as prone as we are to have false intuitions about it, as long as philosophers have grappled with it, this one apologist thinks he's figured it out so thoroughly that he can call anybody who doesn't explain it using his concept of God a liar. Pretty grandiose there, Greg. The really simple fact is, there's a third option he just flatly overlooks, which is, duh, be decent to other people and expect others to do the same because you fundamentally care about their well-being. This concern for people is as objective or subjective as Kokel's concern for the will of a god, and it's a totally adequate, and I'd argue parsimonious, explanation for this behavior. I mean, you see someone espousing what looks like morality and you think, huh, I wonder why he's nice to those around him. Maybe it's because he cares about them. But Kokel says, no, this behavior can only possibly make sense because the person cares about a different being that we can't see or in any other way detect. Oh, and by the way, concern for this being is my current argument for why it exists. It's kind of silly. What's more, by ignoring this third option, Greg is proposing an inherently sociopathic idea of morality, with the only question being whether we're sociopaths running free or sociopaths that God keeps on a leash. Yeah, I, I'm i looking at this question, and the first thing I want to say is I don't think fool is exactly the same as stupid. They're not saying – this is this is not about intelligence. This is about foolishness. You can right. be a very smart person and be foolish. Right. So it's not an insult to their intelligence. If you insult me, you're not going to smooth things over by saying it's not specifically an insult to my intelligence especially when you do so by splitting hairs over whatever difference exists between being stupid and foolish. Also, interesting to hear Greg agree with this. I mean, before he said the psalmist was calling disbelief in God dumb. Make up your mind, Greg. But when you ask, are there other scriptural explanations, I think the easiest one is we're fallen. Right. We're dead in our transgressions. We're by nature children of wrath. We 
uh, the natural man cannot understand the, the spiritual things. We are in rebellion against God. We do not want to acknowledge him. Right. That is throughout the New Testament. And it's not even just in Romans 1, although Romans 1 is, is very explicit about that. Mm-hmm. There's this little verbal sleight of hand apologists like to do. Or would that be sleight of mouth? Whatever. When they insult atheists for being depraved. Notice that Amy said, we are fallen. We are in rebellion against God. We do not want to acknowledge him. Now, semantically, this is talking about everybody, Christians and non-believers, and thus has a, we are not as bad as you just saved by grace feel to it. But let's make no mistake. Realistically, this is bad-mouthing atheists, and in this context, it's meant to distinguish Christians from atheists. Sure, we're fallen creatures by nature. But the Christian at least accepts God's help rising out of this fallen state while the atheist wallows in it. We might all have a tendency to pull away from God, but the Christian struggles against this tendency while the atheist gives into it and purposely runs from God. And we all might not want to acknowledge him, but the Christian does. I mean, that's the point of Christianity, right? While the atheist simply pretends he doesn't exist. In all of this, the only thing Christians say they share with us is a fallen nature we couldn't help being born into. But the whole idea is that given that nature, they made the one good choice it was in their power to make, while we willfully decided to embrace everything terrible and nasty and gross about that fallen nature. So don't fall for the patronizing false humility of this, we are all fallen thing. I also want to point out the basic failure of Amy's answer. She's not even offering her caller what he's looking for. He wanted other scriptural explanations that explain sincere disbelief, But she's just giving him threads of scripture that reiterate the idea of insincere belief in slightly different terms. Not super helpful. But if you do not go into these conversations with an understanding of our spiritual state, you're going to miss out what is going on here because there is a lot more going on than just arguments. And here's the practical application of all this horrible advice. It's not just arguments meaning the conflict between you and non-believers doesn't arise from sincere disagreement. It comes from their willful depravity. I mean, sure, she calls it our spiritual state, but as I just said, that's not a very inclusive our when the point is to explain why you accept God and other people don't. What Amy's doing here is urging Christians to pivot away from open conversation at which they can learn from those they disagree with and toward simply correcting everybody outside their faith or their attitude problem. Not great. Right. And by the way, toss into that mix that the the, the devil has blinded the eyes of the unbeliever. Mm-hmm. And there are actually four verses I quote frequently to uh, to show the power. The whole world lies in the power of the evil one, you know, uh, that he has, has uh, uh, he holds them captive to do his will, things like that. Um, so this is another factor that keeps them from a conscious awareness of the rebellion that they're in and the rejection of the obvious, the things that ought to be obvious to their eyes, things that, say, Mm -hmm. Romans 1 uh, depicts. And what's Greg do? Chime in with a helpful solution that non-believers are under the mental influence of an evil supernatural force. So here's an interesting question. What kind of conversation is a Christian going to have with people whose opinions they think come from Satan? There's a lot at stake here in accepting the truth about the gospel. You you have to humble yourself. You have to admit that you're a sinner. You have to come before God and die to yourself and follow him. You have to do all this? I don't know. I spent a lot of time in churches, and from what I've seen, it seems like it's possible to convert while maintaining your pride or behaving more or less as you please. I mean, as long as you're mainly subjected to white, middle-class, heteronormative temptations. But you get the idea. By contrast, an atheist can also be humble, admit when they behave badly, and die to themselves in the sense of trying to change their behavior for the good of others. These actions aren't some kind of exclusive domain of Christianity. They're a reflection of personal character, and you can just as easily perform them for the sake of people or society in general, for equally valid moral reasons as far as I can tell, as you can perform them for the sake of a god. The Christian instinct to co-opt these virtues To pretend they're a bar you have to clear to join their religion and that people just avoid their religion because it's too much of a sacrifice is pretty trashy and seems like, you know, the opposite of humility. There are a lot of things there that are incentives to not 
accept him right. at all. I only need one incentive, which is the lack of any indication whatsoever that he exists. So this, you have to keep this in mind. One question I like to ask, because I think this will draw out uh, maybe where the real problem is, because I think the real problem is not intellectual. The real problem is they don't like God. Mm-hmm. I mean, ultimately, the the way to bring that out is to say, okay, let's say I convince you that the God of the Bible actually exists. This is this is true, mm-hmm. and what it says about him is true, and what he requires of us is true. Would you follow him and see what they say? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Why don't you believe in the invisible bodiless spirit being we have no tangible evidence for? Must be because you don't like him. Sure, whatever. The question of whether you believe something exists is so unrelated to the question of whether you'd follow it that trying to connect them is silly. Again, descriptive, not disparaging. Like just a hypothetical thing. Would you follow this God? Would you love this God? Do you love the God of the Bible, but you just don't believe he's actually mm-hmm. real? Because there are certainly there are certainly books that we read where we love the characters and we're, right. we could think, maybe I wish this, this character were real, uh-huh. but he's not. So just looking at him as a character, what do you think about God? Mm-hmm. I've never once believed or disbelieved in a character because of how much I didn't like it. Why would this weird tendency suddenly start with a character of God from Hebrew scripture? And then maybe you can draw some of this out and start there because that stuff is going on in the background even if it doesn't come up. Right. I think this is a better indication of what's going on in the background of their heads than of the head of an atheist. And from what I've seen, it's pretty ugly. This program was made possible by a grant from John Adams, Bob Generic, Maggie Danger, S.R. Foxley, Daniel Bostet, Magnus Holmgren, Precipitating Pisces 250, and Q, and by the generous support of viewers like you. If you'd like to join them in pledging to this channel, please find a link to the Prophet of Zod Patreon below.